we'll go ahead and get started with the second half of my presentation. All right. So what I'm going to do at this point is to go back to Dr. Kelly's story, because I had taken you through where Dr. Kelly had modified his diet to a raw, most almost 100% vegetarian type of diet. And he had also started to take pancreatic enzymes. Um, but what he found as he was taking his pancreatic enzymes is that he started to feel sick. He started to get a lot of aches and pains, um, nausea, lousy appetite, and bit by bit he got to a point where he wasn't able to take his pancreatic enzymes anymore. And then what he found was after a few days, he started feeling better. And so he was able to resume his enzymes, but then a few days later he started feeling sick again. Um, and so this went up and down, up and down, up and down for a little while. And he realized that the tumor in his abdomen was starting to go in the wrong direction again. And he got really upset because the, the, uh, the, the enzymes seemed to be changing his tumor for the better. But whenever he tried to take them, he would start getting sick. And his theory was that what was happening was that the enzymes were creating waste materials and that those had built up in his system. Um, what he was getting then was kind of like serum sickness, as it's described in the medical literature, where um, people can start feeling sick um, from, in effect, waste materials. And so he thought about what solution he could come up with for this problem, and um, what he's, where he says he got his final solution, coffee enemas, was from something called the Merck Manual. The Merck Manual is described as the oldest continually published medical textbook uh, in the world. It was, it's, it was started around 1899, and um, it's still in print, in effect, although it's only available digitally now. Coffee enemas were included in the Merck Manual until the mid-1970s, and my colleague Nick Gonzalez actually wrote the editors of the journal asking them why they'd taken it out. He got a letter back um, saying that they were removed for space considerations only. There weren't any concerns about safety. Um, but Kelly said that he got the idea for coffee enemas from the Merck manual. Um, what he found was that by doing coffee enemas, he felt better, and he was able to continue taking his pancreatic enzymes. Now, many times people hearing this think that Dr. Kelly might have been poaching from Dr. Max Gerson, another alternative practitioner who also was uh, widely, a wide, uh, how could I say, an advocate of coffee enemas and used them quite extensively in his work, and that Kelly just wasn't giving Gerson credit, et cetera, et cetera. And certainly Gerson used them very extensively, but Kelly always claimed he got them from the Merck Manual. And in fact, looking at the medical literature, Dr. Gerson did not invent coffee the enemas either. Um, they came from the medical literature. Um, thanks to Google Books, it's possible to look at very old journals. And uh, so, for example, um, I found references as far back as the 1860s, probably could have gone further back if I'd wanted to keep looking. Um, they were used pretty widely for poisoning. Uh, one of the Mayo brothers who founded the Mayo Clinic um, gave a lecture in 1896 where he was recommending the use of coffee enemas as a part of routine perioperative care. And there's a fascinating article by a surgeon in Uruguay, which published in 1941, where he was using pan uh, coffee enemas in the treatment of shock of various kinds, including septic shock. Uh, I wrote an article on this topic, and that can be seen at my website, drlindai.com slash detox, if you're interested in more information about coffee enemas. Um, here's a text, uh, some pictures from a textbook in 1950. This is a nursing textbook talking about the use of coffee enemas with a rather interesting little graphic there about how to administer them. So they were very widely used in the medical literature. Um, and they're quite safe when done as directed. Um, so that is the components of the program that Dr. Kelly used for himself. A diet which was predominantly vegetarian, um, pancreatic enzymes, and a lot of other supplements as well, and then a detoxification using coffee enemas. And so with this protocol, Dr. Kelly got better. 
He put the weight back on. He was back at work practicing orthodontics. Except what happened bit by bit was that word of his success got out in the medical community uh, and the community at large. And so he wound up having patients come to him that did not want their teeth straightened. They wanted their cancer straightened out. Um, so he has practiced bit by bit change from conventional orthodontics to practice as an alternative cancer um, therapist. This, of course, did not sit terribly well with the medical community, especially when he published a little book called One Answer to Cancer. The first version, I believe, was published in 1969, and this, uh, this released quite a torrent of persecution toward Dr. Kelly's direction, including such things as losing his dental license, um, having his house burned down, from what I understood, and uh, generally being hounded and harassed quite a bit over the years. Now, Dr. Kelly was offering this same protocol um, to patients uh, in the book, One Answer to Cancer. He was describing a diet that was almost 100% vegetarian, along with the enzymes and detoxification. And what he found was that he was getting a lot of people well, but not everybody. And this was especially pointed out or, or poignant to him when he was seeing a fairly young woman with terribly severe allergies. And what happened when he put her on the protocol was that initially she improved, but then after about six months, things started to go downhill. And so he had her on you know, lots of fruits and vegetables and carrot juice and et cetera, et cetera, and she was getting worse. So he gave her more fruits and vegetables and et cetera, et cetera, and she kept getting worse. And there were a couple of problems with this whole scenario. One was that he and this woman had started to get romantically involved. Um, his first marriage had ended in divorce, and she was eventually actually to become his second wife. So he had a very personal interest in her well-being, but he also knew that if somebody actually died under his care, and especially somebody with allergies, you know, not even with cancer, that this was going to be really bad. And so he kept trying more and more fruits and vegetables, more and more fruits and vegetables, and she just kept getting worse. Finally, in desperation, and a mark of a, a true genius, I think, is that they can recognize when what they're doing just is not working and it's time to try something different, he tried, oh, here's a, one more fruit and vegetable here, and then he tried meat. He gave her some meat, and within 24 hours, she was feeling tremendously better, and she apparently continues to eat meat to this day, um, from what I hear. So, uh, so meat was what this woman needed, and from that, he realized that not everybody does well on the same type of diet. This led him back to the medical literature, as, as usual. He, he got interested to see what he could find out about whether anybody else had speculated that different people need different kinds of diets. And one uh, practitioner who did a lot of work in this area is a man named Dr. Francis Pottinger. His works are available primarily through the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation, um, which I highly recommend as a source of interesting nutrition literature and many studies and information that really couldn't be reproduced today. For example, Dr. Weston Price um, was a dentist who traveled all over the world looking at the states of health of people eating their original indigenous traditional diets versus the diets that had come to them along with uh, colonization, um, canned foods, cooked foods, you know, in effect, our standard American diet, I suppose, although things have even deteriorated further since then. And what Dr. Price found was that people eating their traditional diets, a lot of whole foods, um, could, would do very, very well, and their children and grandchildren on um, processed foods, their health would deteriorate. Um, this is the kind of research that really couldn't be done today, because at this point there are aren't too many people out there eating a traditional diet. Um, and what Price also found was that people did well on a wide variety of diets. There were some people that were eating a predominantly vegetarian diet, and there were some that were eating quite a lot of red meat and fat. Um, so Price's work demonstrated not only that unprocessed food is good, but that different people could do well on different diets. Um, with the Pottingers, there were actually several um, physicians named Pottinger 
um, two of them whose work the Price Pottinger Foundation supports and keeps alive. Uh, one of them, um, Francis Pottinger Jr., was involved with some cat studies where he took a group of cats. There were some that were fed on raw food and some that were fed on cooked food, comparing the health of the two groups. His father, Francis Pottinger Sr., um, was involved in studies of the autonomic nervous system. And he wrote a book called Symptoms of Visceral Disease in which he talked about his theory that ill health could be explained by an imbalance in what's called the autonomic nervous system. Now, for those of us with a medical background, uh, the autonomic nervous system, typically in medical school, is something that you learn and promptly forget because you don't really necessarily use it all that much on a day-to-day -day basis. But in the work that we do, it's actually highly relevant, and I'll talk about it a little bit more now. The autonomic nervous system ha is the system that's in charge of the functions of your body that you don't have to consciously think about. You don't have to remind your heart to beat or your stomach to digest food. Those things just happen. But they are under nervous control, and that system is the autonomic nervous system. It has two parts, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic system is, um, is described here on the left-hand side, and there's a lot of anatomy that I'm not going to get into because it's not really that important. But the sympathetic system is in charge of the fight-or-flight system, the things that help you get out of the way if you look up and you're about to get hit by a bus. So the sympathetic system, um, as the, the uh, little pictures describe, the sympathetic system will tend to open up the bronchi in the lungs so you can breathe better, and it will tend to speed up your heart so you can pump lots of blood to your muscles so you can move fast, to your brain so you can think fast. But it tends to shut down the digestion because if you're about to get hit by a bus, digesting your lunch really isn't that important. It can wait. The parasympathetic system is in charge of the rest, digest, repair, rebuild type of system. So when the parasympathetic system fires, it will tend to slow down the heart, but it speeds up the digestion, and it speeds up the secretion of things like pancreatic enzymes, which are needed to help digest the food. That's its job, rest and digest. The parasympathetic system is also in charge of the immune system. So when it fires, the immune system tends to be stimulated. And so so for ideal health, you want to have both systems working in a fairly balanced kind of way. Because if one of those systems is on too much of the time, the other system doesn't get a chance to do its job. And because an overactive sympathetic system, for example, um, will put you in a fight or flight situation all the time, even when it's not necessary. Um, so he would... Uh, uh, Pottinger describes somebody within, uh, with the fight or flight system being overactive as somebody who's very quick, somebody who's very sharp, very, very snappy, so to speak, tend to be irritable, tend to be anxious, um, tend to get up early in the morning. Um, and uh, tend to have a rapid heartbeat, but they have very poor digestion because that, over, uh, that overriding sympathetic system is constantly telling the digestive system, not now, not now, not now, not now. And so they have a hard time digesting their food. They tend to do well on a more vegetarian diet because all of the, the roughage is actually very helpful for their gut. And also, they tend to do well with some carbohydrates in their diet because their digestion isn't very good. So in order to get the fuel, they need the carbohydrates. So just as an example here, the sympathetic system being overactive. So you know, to borrow an analogy that Nick once used in a lecture, as I was getting ready for this today, you know, I was thinking about what do I need to say, what do I need to do, and I was getting a little bit irritable, and my poor husband just asked me the innocent question, you know, do you want to go eat breakfast before you take a shower? And I said, we already said that. I already talked about that. You know, because I was thinking about something else, and my sympathetic system was on full blast, and so I got a little irritable, and I was a little bit anxious. What will happen afterwards, though, uh, again, borrowing from Nick, is that the rest and digest system comes on. Because after I'm done with this lecture, I don't need my sympathetic system to be plugging away anymore. And so the rest and digest system comes on, and that tends to make a person more relaxed, more calm, maybe a little bit lethargic even depressed, perhaps. And this would be the kind of depression where people are just flat as a pancake, can't even think. They just feel blah. 
Um, and um, in that state, you know, after I'm done with this lecture, some of you may come up and ask me a question, and I will seem a little foggy and a little bit out of it. Well, that's because my sympathetic system has been on all morning, and it wants a break, and the parasympathetic system is operating. So I will seem a very foggy person, and you'll wonder, well, how in the world did she just talk for two hours? Well, it's because the sympathetic system, having done its job, has now decided to take a break. So someone with an overactive a parasympathetic system as a general rule tends to be a night owl with a slow heartbeat, with a fast digestion, um, and so they actually do well with a lot of protein and fat, things that are a bit harder to digest because their digestive system is so efficient that if they eat a lot of carbohydrates, what they'll get is a burst of energy followed by a slump. Um, what they need is slow-burning food, like protein, like fat. Um, and so what Dr. Kelly realized when he was reading all of this was that he was seeing something very similar to what he himself had observed, that some people seem to do very well with the, the more vegetarian type of diet, but that he had some patients, like his second wife, who seemed to need a certain amount of meat. Um, Dr. Pottinger also did a number of experiments where he established that different minerals could have a different effect on the autonomic nervous system. The, that calcium could stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, he found. Magnesium could tame down the overactive sympathetic system. And then potassium, he felt, could stimulate the parasympathetic system. And so the net result, um, Pottinger believed that human health was impacted by an imbalance of the various nutrients and of diet, and by adjusting these things, he could actually bring the nervous system into better balance and thereby bring about better health. Um, and so he conducted a number of experiments, were described in his book. Um, and found that that was the case. Now, regular medicine tends to have the opinion that everybody is the same. But Pottinger was one of the first to argue that, no, we're not the same, and that we need different balances of minerals, of diet, and et cetera. And Kelly wound up finding the same thing um, in his practice. So uh, what Kelly wound up creating was the concept that we all exist somewhere on a spectrum here. And since the pointer, unfortunately, and this thing is not working too well, um, I guess what I will try to do here is do a little bit of semaphoring. So hopefully I'm standing right under the balance point. I guess I'm looking at the middle of the auditorium, so hopefully this will work. Um, so what Kelly was saying, based on his own observations and Pottinger's, was that there's some people whose sympathetic system is overactive, and there's some people whose parasympathetic system is overactive. And everybody will feel better in a state of balance. So the things that move our metabolism from one place to another. So magnesium and potassium will tend to push people in this direction. Okay? And so will an alkalinizing type of diet. Um, the primary alkalinizing things would be things like um, citrus or some of the bitter leafy greens, like those bitter green drinks that, that people, um, some people like to drink. So you, will, um, you can move anyone in this direction by eating those kind of foods. So it's good for somebody with an overactive sympathetic system because that will bring them into balance. But if somebody is balanced to begin with, or if they're even parasympathetic, if you give them a lot of magnesium, a lot of potassium, a lot of alkalinizing foods, what you will do is, in effect, move them further this direction, away from balance, and they'll start to feel bad. Now, the, uh, the things that can push metabolism in the other direction, you have um, calcium as the primary mineral that pushes people in the more sympathetic direction. You have red meat um, primarily as an acid-forming food, which again will push people in the sympathetic direction. So if somebody starts off as a parasympathetic dominant and you give them those things, they will move toward balance. But if you give those types of things, like a lot of calcium or a lot of red meat, to somebody who's a sympathetic dominant, you will make them even more sympathetic. 
And it's interesting, actually, from my point of view as a physician, reading the general medical literature, because this type of information actually helps me make sense out of things that can be confusing to folks who are looking at the world that everybody needs the same thing. For example, um, there was a study a few years back that suggested that calcium supplementation, which is widely advocated for osteoporosis, but that calcium uh, supplementation can provoke heart attacks in a few people. Well, what I would say is that calcium can provoke a heart attack when it's, well, first of all, calcium will always stimulate the sympathetic system to be more strongly on. And it depends on which population you give it to as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, if you give it to somebody whose sympathetic system is already on too strong, it's going to make it even stronger. And that sympathetic overstimulation um, could potentially cause a heart attack. Well, a few years later, somebody else does what's called a meta-analysis, and they wind up saying, no, no, it's not true after all, don't worry about it, calcium doesn't cause heart attacks. What that would suggest is that perhaps, and again, one of these days I should go look and see where these studies were done, but in perhaps the study that showed that calcium precipitates heart attacks was done in a place where, ge a geographic place where they have a lot of sympathetic dominance, because the tendency to have one of these systems or the other be overactive does tend to track along with genetics to some degree, especially when you consider that you know, it would depend on what foods were available to our ancestors. Um, so for example, um, people with an overactive sympathetic system tend to do well with a more vegetarian diet. If that's what was available in a particular geographic locale, then those are the people that would do the best in that environment. Those are the people that would be more likely to have a successful life, have kids, um, you know, procreate. Uh, in other words, the people that didn't do well in that environment would either die or leave. Um, but the people that would do well in a particular location um, would be the people that were genetically well disposed to metabolize the diet they got. So if you do a study on calcium metabolism and you happen to be doing it with a group of people that are sympathetic dominants, it's not going to be good for them. But if you do it with a different group of people, they'll do fine. Um, so the idea, again, that different people do well on different types of diets is something that's um, very key to the program that we use and very key to what Dr. Pottinger found. Um, and I believe that this is something that bit by bit is going to be discovered in the, med in the general medical world as they get more involved in trying to do precision medicine, you know, genetics and et cetera, that I think that bit by bit we may well get there, but we're not there yet in terms of what most people um, believe, including many in of those in the alternative world as well. Um, so uh, Dr. Kelly also found that cancers and different types of cancers tended to cluster depending on what type of autonomic imbalance that people had. So for example, in the left-hand column, you'll see those with a sympathetic dominant. They tended to have the type of cancer that's called a carcinoma. So that would include things like breast cancer, prostate, colon, lung, pancreas, and it's most cancer patients. Um, those people will do best with a more alkalinizing diet. Uh, they do well with a lot of magnesium and potassium. Um, the opposite group, uh, the parasympathetic dominance, they tend to have the cancers of the immune system. And remember that uh, the, Im the immune system is stimulated by the parasympathetic system. So an overactive parasympathetic system could well give you uh, a, um, a leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma. Those are some of the cancers that form from the immune system. Uh, melanoma is another one that we typically find does well with a more acidifying diet. Um, and they also, do, they also do well with a lot of calcium in their diet or their supplement program. And so uh, the majority of cancer patients are in the alkalinizing category. And what I always tell my parasympathetic cancer patients is that if you walk into a health food store and you tell them, I have cancer, what should I do? 95% of what they tell you will be wrong because the typical advice um, for a cancer patient is to alkalinize, 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 but they're already too alkaline, and getting more alkaline is just going to put them further into the fog that they usually come into. Interestingly enough, also, 
the vast majority of people are actually attracted to the, the right kind of a diet. Now, we all, unfortunately, like sweets. And I'm not saying that if you're attracted to chocolate cake, you should go eat it. Um, but my parasympathetic patients typically walk in, and many of them have been trying to do something where they were eating a lot of vegetarian food. And I tell them, you know, what I want you to do is go out, you know, in between our two sessions, I want you to go out tonight, and I want you to find a steak, and I want you to eat it. And they look at me like they have been taken instantly to heaven, and they say, I have been dreaming about red meat. And they, they say, can I have the baked potato? I said, yes, with the butter, with the sour cream, fine. And they're in, they are so happy. Whereas your typical sympathetic dominant, if I tried to tell them to eat that, they would probably feel sick even at the thought. So people do tend um, to a large degree to be attracted to the type of food that works for them. Now, um, so that gives you the components of the program that Kelly used uh, and that Nick and I continue to use and that I'm taking forward into the future. An individualized diet ranging from almost vegetarian to meat three times a day, depending on the patient. Pancreatic enzymes and other supplements. Uh, again, the nature of the other supplements, the calcium, magnesium, potassium, other types of things will vary depending on the underlying problem of the patient. And then finally, detoxification with primarily coffee enemas. That's the backbone of what we do. Um, but there's a number of other cleansing procedures that we use as well. Um, so that is the components of the program that I utilize. Um, now, you may have noticed that in all of this, I never really mentioned something that's active in the alternative world right now, the ketogenic diet. And I was asked to speak a little bit about oxygenation and cancer. This isn't something that uh, we've actually focused on a lot in our work. But I went ahead and did a little research, and uh, we'll talk to you about it now. The idea of uh, oxygenation and cancer um, comes about because of the work of a man named Dr. Otto Warburg, who in 1931 uh, received the Nobel Prize for discovering that cancer metabolizes energy differently than most cells in the body. Um, and for those from the medical world, uh, to metabolize glucose, all cells use a pathway called glycolysis to start with, but then the end products of that go into what's called the Krebs cycle to give the bulk of the energy that you get from glucose. And the Krebs cycle requires oxygen, and it requires the mitochondria to be working well. Um, cancer cells stop at the glycolysis point, um, and you get a little bit of energy out of that, but you wind up with a buildup of lactic acid in the cells. Um, but it's a form of energy production that does not require oxygen. And Warburg discovered that uh, cancer cells use this preferentially. Nobody argues about this. This is accepted in the medical literature. What's argued about are the implications of what Dr. Warburg found. Um, and Dr. Warburg, as I understand it, believed that cancer arose because of low oxygen. So the cells in that low oxygen environment would be forced to use glycolysis or fermentation of glucose as another perhaps easier to pronounce way of um, describing that. Um, that cancer cells were forced to ferment glucose and what would happen, or rather cells in a low oxygen environment would be forced to ferment glucose, and that that would then get them stuck in this situation, which then made them turn into cancer cells. So the idea was that um, if you increase oxygen to the tissue, that conceivably you could affect the cancer cells and maybe get them to behave themselves or, or die with large amounts of oxygen. And some of the treatments that are based on that premise would include things like ozone or hydrogen peroxide, for example. Um, another approach that's used uh, based on the theories of Dr. Warburg is that if cancer cells are dependent on fermenting glucose, that would also imply that they can't use the energy that one can get from fat, for example. And so uh, the argument is there that if you decrease glucose, you can starve the cancer cells with what's called the ketogenic diet. Um, so that's another uh, theory that comes out of Dr. Warburg's original discovery. But here is where I'd like to talk just a little bit about the idea of correlation versus causation. In other words, so cancer cells work mainly on glycolysis, fermenting glucose. But does that necessarily mean that low oxygen causes cancer or that 
interfering with uh, this metabolism can deal with cancer. And correlation versus causation. An illustration I can give you would be the apartment that my husband and I used to live in where there was a small dog who every day when the letter carrier started walking down the sidewalk would start to bark. And then the letter carrier would put the mail through the box and the dog would go berserk. And then the letter carrier would leave. And this happened every day. And that dog is absolutely convinced that the barking is what made the letter carrier leave. That's correlation, but it's not causation because we know that it's got nothing to do with the barking. The letter carrier is just doing its job. In the case of cancer cells and the way that they metabolize, what I believe is that the fact that they're preferential, anaerobic, fermenting glucose is really a byproduct of where they come from. I believe that cancer cells come from the trophoblast, and the trophoblast cells actually are also preferential anaerobes um, because they live in a very, very, very low oxygen environment. Um, the trophoblast is active when the embryo is floating its way down the fallopian tube and then floating around in the uterus. The trophoblast's job is to latch onto the uterus and then create a blood supply, and all of that's going to take a little time. And in that period, there's no oxygen because, or very little, because it's only going to be getting what manages to seep through the, um, the tissue until such time as it's created that blood supply. So the trophoblast is known to be a cell that does well in a low oxygen environment. And so if cancer cells come from the trophoblast, cancer cells are going to have the same type of metabolism. Doesn't mean that low oxygen is what causes cancer in the first place. And in fact, I found um, one of the puzzles that Nick and I always had was that lung, the lungs are the most highly oxygenated tissue in the body, and yet lung cancer is the number one killer of of people in this country. So how do you, if, if low oxygen is required for cancer development, how do you get lung cancer? And in fact, I found an article um, that was published in the last year that showed that at a higher altitude, up in the mountains, where oxygen is lower, there's less oxygen up there, there's actually less lung cancer. Um, and you would expect that if oxygen is key to preventing cancer, that there would be more cancer at a higher altitude, but in fact there's less. And the authors of this article um, are, were even speculating that oxygen is carcinogenic. Um, and uh, another consideration would be that there are some parts of the body that don't have much blood supply and so therefore would have lower oxygen. For example, cartilage. The cartilage in your knee, for example, there's no, there's no blood vessels out there. The cancer of the cartilage is actually extremely rare. It does happen, but it's not one of your big ticket killers the way lung cancer is. Um, and then a final consideration as far as the ketogenic diet per se. Um, your body fights really hard to maintain your blood sugar in a narrow range. Um, and I would certainly agree that a high blood sugar, like with diabetes or having a, a blood sugar that's higher than normal, is not good for you for a lot of different reasons. But it's not really physically possible to get your blood sugar low enough to make a major impact on that cancer. The reason is, again, your body fights to maintain your blood sugar. And so if you don't eat any carbohydrates at all, what will happen is that your body will start taking the protein that you eat and turn that into glucose to maintain your blood glucose in that narrow range. And if you then proceed to stop eating any kind of protein and only eat fat, um, which sounds a little um, unappealing, I don't know, buttered avocados, I'm not quite sure what one would eat in that case. But if you manage to do that, then what your body will do is start taking the protein out of your muscles. Um, to man maintain your blood sugar in a narrow range. And if you then manage somehow to run out of muscle, you'll pass out because your brain works on glucose. So you can't get your blood sugar low enough to make a difference. But remember what I said about, you know, in God we trust, all others must show data. Um, what I would say there is that all of the patients that I'm talking to you about today, all of the case reports that I'm mentioning, there's not a single one of them that was doing a ketogenic diet. They were drinking carrot juice, they were eating carbohydrates, um, and they seem to have done just fine. So I just don't think it's necessary to go to those um, draconian lengths um, to deal with cancer. 
So um, having said that, I'm going to go into a few more case reports here. Um, first off, another patient of Dr. Gonzalez's who in 1985 was diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer. And what that means is that at the time of her diagnosis, she had developed bright red tissue over the area of her breast. And this is a very, very bad prognostic sign. Um, she had radiation before surgery, and then at surgery they did a lymph node dissection where they found 18 of 18 lymph nodes were positive. Another very, very bad prognostic sign. So bad that they told her, we're going to start chemo and you're going to be on this forever. Um, and so she began CMF chemo, but a couple of years later, while on it, she developed bone metastases. And so she decided it was time for something completely different. She came to see Dr. Gonzalez in August of 1987. She was actually one of the very first patients that he saw. Um, that's about when he set up his practice in New York. And so, uh, yeah, December of 1987 is when she started with him. Um, and she wasn't a big fan of getting scans, she didn't like the radiation, but in August of 2001, her bone scan was completely clear. And she is still alive as of September of 2016, so she is, what, 29 years out. Um, with the diagnosis, again, remember the inflammatory breast cancer, uh, bad prognosis, bone metastases. It is not typical for somebody to still be alive and looking great after 29 years with that kind of a diagnosis. Another patient, uh, another patient with pancreatic cancer. Oh, and stepping back to the one with breast cancer, I'll tell you that she was on a lot of enzymes, but she was also on a more vegetarian type of diet, as was this gentleman um, with pancreatic cancer. Uh, he was diagnosed in August of 1991. A scan showed that he had multiple uh, little dots in his lungs, and he had four tumors in his liver. He had a tumor in his pancreas. He had something in his adrenal and something in his bone. So they, did, they removed one of the lung tumors. They felt for some reason that that would be the easiest way to get the diagnosis on him. Um, and they told him it was adenocarcinoma. They felt it was most likely pancreatic in origin, although adenocarcinoma of the lung is just as bad as adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. And they told him he had three months to live. He his wife and he actually had a long-standing interest in alternative medicine, and so they started doing some things on their own um, while they figured out what to do. They came in to see Nick in December of 1991. Now, he had a few scans in between then and 1998, which showed stable disease, but then in July of 1998, he had some scans that showed that everything had completely resolved. Um, he actually passed away in 2005. At this point, he was in his mid-80s, and he unfortunately had a car accident um, and wound up in assisted living and, and was lost to our follow-up, passed away a couple of years later. But he had a good, solid 14 years after a diagnosis when his doctors had, at the, that made the diagnosis had told him he'd be dead in three months. And during that time, he certainly led a lot of tours at a local art museum and had a really full and active life. Um, he was actually featured in a piece that Discovery Health did about our work. Um, I think that's still available online. Uh, and he, he was a very interesting and... and um, noteworthy gentleman. Um, one, of the one of the things in that piece, which I've been thinking I should try and, uh, try and get this clip because uh, I think it would really add to this presentation, he was uh, talking on this uh, segment about doing coffee enemas and the people at Discovery Health had asked him, isn't this the weirdest thing you ever heard of? He said, well, you know, I wasn't too impressed when I heard about it at first, but then you know, I gave it a try and it's okay. And then he said, this is what I remember, he said, a friend of mine guy with brain tumor. He used to laugh at me about the coffee enemas. And there was this pause. And then he said, he's dead now, but I'm still here. <laughs> uh, this is another fascinating case of Dr. Gonzalez's. This is a young woman with Burkitt's lymphoma. Burkitt's lymphoma is a really, really nasty lymphoma. And she was 32 years old. Um, when she went from basically fine to having a tumor the size of a football sticking out of her back, 
Um, and so that was in August of 2008. And when they did a scan, they found that she had a number of large masses in her chest, and she was sick as all get out. Now, one thing about Burgett's lymphoma is that usually it responds to chemotherapy. So they gave her chemo with the intention of giving her a bone marrow transplant. Uh, unfortunately for her, the chemo didn't work. Um, she was unable to, she did not re achieve a remission, and so she was told that she was terminal, we're sorry, there's nothing we can do for you, um, and she was basically told to go home and you know, get into hospice. Uh, so in February of 2009, she started with Dr. Gonzalez, and here again, I remember her application because she, we asked people to send in some information about themselves, and I looked at her records and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, this woman is so sick, I don't know. Um, but one interesting thing about her was that she had actually at one time worked to help out somebody else who was on our nutritional program, um, a gentleman with uh, melanoma who had done extremely well as long as he did his program. So she had uh, seen that it could work. And so she was not somebody that had to be begged to do her diet or not that we do that anyway. I mean, I, I just, I try to warn people what they're getting into. Um, but she was not somebody that needed to be talked into anything. She was committed. She was already doing coffee enemas. She already knew that she needed to change her diet. She'd already started eating red meat because she even knew that. Um, she was sold. And so we felt like we were working with somebody who was really committed and who was a young woman with every reason to want to live. And so um, she started her program. Um, when she came in, she was so sick that she was unable to sit up while Dr. Gonzalez explained the program to her. She spent the session curled up on a little couch that he had in his office. She started her program, and a little over a year later, her scan showed that her disease had completely regressed. And a little over a year after that, um, something equally remarkable happened. She had a little girl. The reason that is remarkable is because the chemotherapy that she was given typically causes sterility. She is still alive and doing well. Um, it's been eight years now since that, uh, that terrible diagnosis, and she's one who did well while eating the meat diet, as we would predict, for somebody with a dom uh, the parasympathetic system being overactive. Next patient is one of mine, a patient with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In 1995, he developed swelling in his abdomen and his feet, his legs. And he went to the doctor, they did a scan, and discovered that he had a number of large masses in his abdomen that were putting pressure on the lymphatic system, um, causing all of this swelling. Um, he was found to have follicular lymphoma, which is a type of lymphoma that's a lot less aggressive than the Burkitt's lymphoma, but still not something that you'd really want to have. Um, he refused all, kind, all standard treatment whatsoever, and he came to see me and started in November of 1995. Um, he, again, was not somebody that wanted to get scans all the time, wasn't crazy about the radiation, but in May, one of his doctors uh, talked him into it, and he had a scan which showed complete regression of everything that had been there. Um, he had a few more scans since, all of which look fine. Um, he continues to do his protocol to some extent, but he hasn't come into my office in quite a while. So in September, I gave him a call just to see how he's doing. At this point, he would be probably in his late 50s, 60, along in there. And he told me that he is doing just fine. In fact, when I called, he was out uh, working on a retaining wall for a house. Um, he's going to be moving into a new house, and he's doing a lot of the work himself. So my guess would be that he's probably feeling a whole lot better than a lot of 60-year-old men, um, given that he's capable of doing this kind of thing. So he is doing just fine. Um, so with that, you know, I was thinking, so what can you all take home out of all of this? Um, and so just a few suggestions. Um, pancreatic enzymes. Um, there's something that anyone can take with their meals just to help with general digestion. And remember what Dr. Howell said, or what Dr. Howell believed, that, that taking extra enzymes can actually help preserve your own body's energy because making enzymes takes energy. Um, so taking some extra and eating raw foods, um, all of those things can help preserve preserve your body's 
ability to, to make these things. Um, secondly, coffee enemas. Um, most people are not too enthused when they hear about the concept of coffee enemas, including myself. When I first heard about them, I thought it was the looniest thing I'd ever heard. Um, I can tell you, though, that, well, first of all, yes, I do them myself. I feel much, much better um, from doing them. And my patients are, without exception, totally enthusiastic. And they always come in for their second session you know, after they've been doing their program for six months or so, and they say, I did not believe you, but they are my favorite thing, my absolute favorite thing of the program. So try it. You'll like it. That's what I would say about coffee enemas. Um, diet, again, whole unprocessed foods, um, raw if possible. Um, you want to do whole grains. Um, you know, again, uh, a lot of the things that you've been hearing throughout this session, throughout this, uh, this conference, try and put that into practice. But remember that one diet does not fit all. So if you yourself are eating in a certain way and you feel terrible, it may mean that you need some modification. So whether that be you're trying to do a ketogenic diet and you feel terrible, I would say maybe you need a little carbs. If you're eating nothing but carbs and you feel terrible, maybe you need a little animal protein. Um, just And for practice practitioners there, again, remembering the same thing. One diet does not fit all. And with that, I have run out of material. I'm not too sure if I've run out of time, but perhaps some of you have some questions. Okay. Um, we believe that pancreatic enzymes can work against any type of cancer, not just pancreatic cancer. That's a commonly asked question. But what we believe um, is that pancreatic enzymes can work against the trophoblast-type cells, um, which are the origin of any type of cancer. And certainly, all of the patients that I described, um, what, the bulk of them were not actually pancreatic cancer, and yet it was pancreatic enzymes that was used. Okay. With those enzymes, wow, wow. <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> with those, with those enzymes, no, you can use okay. it. With those enzymes, what is the typical like dosage kind of scheduling? You said with food, without food, but I've had some patients say they take a lot, and it's like a meal itself, just the pills. Mm -hmm. What is the average, I guess, patient dosage? Right. Okay. Like a day. Well, first of all, I, I probably have to say a disclaimer because, you know, the medical world frowns on me giving input that can make somebody go treat themselves. So uh, I, I take no responsibility for anything anybody does with this answer. Um, having said that, um, the, the dosage range probably goes somewhere between, you know, per day, um, 25 grams to 45 grams. And this can vary depending on the type of cancer. Um, patients with a more more sympathetic dominant cancer tend to be on the high end of that, partly because their own sympathetic system is telling their own pancreas, not now, not now, not now, so they usually need a lot of enzymes. Um, and we do divided doses over the course of the day. Um, uh, away from meals, and that's uh, that's an important part of it. Now, we, I'd also recommend some enzymes with meals, um, just because uh, uh, people need it for digestion. In regards to the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, mm -hmm. systems that you're identifying in your patients, do you do alkaline testing of their systems, or how do you help determine, you know, if, if they're just kind of clueless as, you know, I eat, well, I eat everything, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, some people do eat everything. There are some people who, by nature, are blessed with a balanced system, and those people can and should eat a variety of different types of foods. In fact, uh, what I recommend for those people is that they go with their instincts. There may be times that they want red meat twice a day, and there's other times they don't want it at all. Um, many you know, people, if they're, if they're sick, uh, they may not be able to tell, but as their health improves, you know, with our program, with detoxification. And there's some aspects I haven't really gotten into. We use glandulars like, you know, freeze-dried adrenal or thymus, which can help um, various systems repair. 
so there are some people that are balanced. Um, and so then the, the goal is to maintain balance. Um, Dr. Kelly had an elaborate computer questionnaire that he used. Uh, we tend to go by clinical experience um, just because most of the patients that we see are cancer patients. And they do tend to fall into distinct patterns depending on what their, their tissue of origin is. Um, there's things that can be done with blood work as well, but a lot of this is unfortunately kind of outside the scope of what I can really break down at this point. Any other questions? Way up at the top. I'm coming. Pretty good? I'll keep coming. Well, I don't think double-blind studies would work too well with coffee enemas. Uh, you know, generally speaking, people are pretty aware of whether they're doing that or not. So we've never, um, the closest I could say that we could come to that would be the animal studies. Um, and I must admit that, uh, you know, after our experience, perhaps you missed the, the first hour, but um, we had tried to do a case, what turned into a case control study. Um, uh, with our treatment versus chemotherapy with pancreatic cancer, but the study turned into such a mess uh, that we personally think the results are, are not particularly valuable. Um, what I believe, in effect, you're asking for is a success rate, which is one of the most common questions we've gotten over the years. And Nick and I had written an article um, kind of responding to that question that uh, was published in the peer-reviewed journal, Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine, um, at the beginning of last year. Um, the trouble with doing the kind of work that we do is that there's a gazillion different variables, and compliance is a huge one. Um, so it makes it very difficult to be able to um, to conclusively say, you know, X percentage of the patients we see do well. Um, and also, you know, I've listened to you know, enough presentations about uh, where people talk about, for instance, their success rate versus the um, success rate for or how patients do in general um, to know that the numbers can be um, manipulated in various ways. So the net result is that we have decided to just focus on case reports as an example of what the treatment method can do. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of variables. Um, compliance is a huge variable. Not everybody does their program. Some patients are frightened enough that they start adding on other things without telling us. Um, in many cases, they add on things that actually interfere. Um, and so uh, we don't think it's possible to generate data that would convince a physician. Um, therefore, I'm not going to generate that to try to talk patients into the treatment either. Question? Oh, is it OK? Any other questions? Are we? Oh, Tia, you got a question? Come, come. Oh, the blood type diet is not something that we use, uh, so no, that's not What was the experience. question? The, the blood type, she asked if we use the blood type diet, uh, you know, eat right for your type, uh, that, that theory, and no, we don't. If somebody's, if somebody's um, raw diet or, or eating raw food, do they not have to take enzymes? Well, it depends on what they're trying to deal with, um, and also, of course, whether they came to see me or not. Okay. But, um, but I would say that a purely raw diet is not going to take care of cancer for the vast majority of people. Um, what it does, though, it frees up the body's own enzymes to deal with cancer, and there are some people who have done well on a raw diet, but um, I think the vast majority of people need extra enzymes in addition. Okay, I'm talking about the digestive enzyme that on a daily basis we use, not being in your program, but, um, you know, we use a digestive enzyme just so that we could digest our food. Do we need it if we have raw footers? Or? Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I couldn't. I'm not sure if that microphone is on. I didn't okay. really. Okay, I go. actually, there you go. my voice, I can't stand it. But um, what I'm asking is if somebody is a raw fooder, like, eating raw foods, do they need those digestive enzymes in general, like, you know, we have to? Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, 
you know, again, if it was me, I would probably take them, but, uh, okay. but prob perhaps not. Okay. Um, it's really hard to say. What about probiotics? I think probiotics are valuable for everybody, so okay. yeah, we use them in just about anybody. Okay, thank you. Okay. Do you have any other questions? All right, let's give it up for Dr. Isaacs. That was great. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Isaacs.